G'day, Chris Joseph here. For a while now I've been thinking about the concept of eye sweet and what makes a boat eye sweet or uh, what makes the lines pleasant to look at. Let me think about the reasons for that. And um, if you go back to the origins of this style of boat, they're Nordic in origin and uh, often we talk about British boat styles and Euro European boat styles, French styles, Australian boat styles but they all trace their roots back to the Nordic design. The time of the Vikings' earliest known Atlantic crossings were determined by dating the remnants of trees that were felled in Newfoundland. Scientists have determined that it's likely that the Norse people first set foot in the Americas in the year AD 1021. As time has gone on and man's ingenuity has meant that we've had a variety of different materials, whether it be uh, ferro cement or fiberglass or steel or aluminium or carbon fiber or wood even or plywood um, often it's been the material that the boat is built out of that has determined the lines of the boat so I was fortunate enough to have access to pretty good quality hue and pine back in the 80s um, there still is some available but it's very limited in supply so I'm thinking about the original Nordic boats the Viking boats if you like and uh, what were they built of? Well, they, they were built from timber which was uh, mature age stands of timber. Uh, it would have been um, largish trees that probably wouldn't have had many knots in them. And maybe they even split the timber rather than sawed it. I wouldn't be sure about that. But split timber has the benefit of following the, the line of the grain. And uh, that means you don't have short grain, so that means when you go to bend that timber, it's less likely to fracture. So I think there's a very strong link between the type of material a boat is built out of and the design. And whether we got used to the design and grew to love it, or whether it was just innately a beautiful thing, I'm not sure. But we all know what we like and what we don't like. So to one person, uh, America's Cup foiling boat is a thing of great beauty. I think they are very different um, style of thing but they're still a beautiful thing and uh, we go back to a traditional boat like this and the lines are appealing there is a link between form and function which I think as human beings we just naturally see that and if it if it works then it probably is going to look eye sweet hmm. maybe maybe not I'm not sure I think one of the things that makes moonlight uh, an eye sweet boat, a pretty boat that most people seem to like, and I certainly like her, um, <clears throat> is the uh, the shape of the tuck. So you can see there she's got a wine glass kind of effect here. And sometimes, in particular, uh, some of the British boats, there's a line that comes more around here. And there's a reason for that, there's a trade-off. It's hard to build them this way. You've got a compound curve here, which is difficult if not impossible to create in some materials. In order to create that wine glass effect, you've got to be able to steam that, that timber uh, so that it's curving not only this way, but also this way. I think it's something they can probably do in aluminium and they can certainly do it in fiberglass. Even certain types of timber are not going to want to accommodate that kind of a curve. So I can understand why in some cases they've just taken the line straight across like this. But to me it detracts from the from the uh, inherent beauty of the boat. And the, the planks are 12 millimeter thick quarter sawn hue and pine. If you don't know what quarter sawn means, it means uh, sometimes they call it a radial cut. That means that the board is cut directly between the outside of the um, of the log to the center of the log and so the grain runs this way across the board. Some people call it plain sawn. Um, the other kind of, of uh, sawing is more like this. You can see the top piece here on, on, the, on the transom is a back sawn piece um, which some people call it crown sawn and you get this kind of arch effect in the grain. So it's cut at a tangent to this to the center of the tree. The benefit of quarter sawn timber is that it's more stable and it's a more reliable um, shape that it will create whereas uh, back sawn or backed off timber um, has a tendency to want to cup 
in a certain direction and the reason for it is that the shrinkage in timber between the radial direction and the tangential direction so this is back uh, this is quarter sawn remember so the grain is running across the board like so um, so the difference is that timber tends to shrink less in this direction in the radial direction in from the center of the tree to the outside of the tree than it does in a tangential direction and it's the difference between that shrinkage radial to tangential shrinkage that it creates um, inherent stability in the timber so uh, the bigger the difference between the radial and the tangential shrinkage the, the less stable the timber is going to be so you can see there that wine glass effect that uh, that people tend to like but uh, remember it's the it's a more difficult shape to create and if you're going to have a, a stressful moment when you're building a clinker built boat it's going to be when you're steaming that first strike that that um, garbage strike onto the keel and this this boat is not perfect and there are several things that I did in my 20s that uh, I might be able to avoid if I did it today but then again there are things I did in my 20s that I don't think I could even uh, come any, anywhere near today so how do you create a nice shear line on a boat because that's one of the things which is really going to separate the uh, the not so great from the beautiful boats and how does that actually come about well it starts when you put the first strike on creating a nice shear on a clinker built dinghy out of solid timber starts with that first strike the shear strike and the next strike after that was steamed on in this boat and again you've got that compound curve to the extreme here and uh, I do remember busting a couple of planks uh, not surprising when I look at the extreme shape there make sure that the timbers green don't let it season and get dry like I did uh, and also um, chasing out this rebate around here to create less stress around this point here is something that I would uh, be less afraid to remove a bit more timber there next time so the first strike goes on without knocking down the top edge so you fit the strike to the keel scribe it to the keel uh, but this top line is purely the the line which the board naturally creates the second strike same thing uh, my mentor john told me uh, that some people do knock these down a little bit here just to stop it climbing up the stem so rapidly in this case i didn't knock that down at all and then once I got the first couple of strikes on, then it was just a matter of dividing the distance here to get up to the shear strike. Now, um, the challenge that I created there was I hadn't didn't really leave quite enough space for that shear strike, which should really be a little bit wider than what we have here on Moonlight. I built Moonlight without any plans. I didn't do any technical things like lofting. I had a set of frames, patterns for the stem and stern, and the frames had some notches in them, but I ignored them because I didn't know what they meant. Some of the earlier boat builders in Tasmania were essentially illiterate. They couldn't read a tape measure, and they used to build beautiful boats using nothing more than a measuring stick. This is where the ice sweet terminology comes about. John was strong on ice sweet, and somehow Moonlight came together pretty well. I did have a lot of black and white photos that I took of a boat that John originally built, but she was from King Billy Pine, another even more rare Tasmanian timber. King Billy bends and works differently and therefore creates a different shaped hull. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about handcrafted wooden boats. Depending on the timber that you have available, it's going to shape the outcome. Some people think they're climbing a bit too fast so they do knock this down a bit much and then you can get these things that are kind of turned down at the bow. Moonlight was shaped around five sets of frames. Some people just build them with four. The fifth frame goes right up the bow near the little seat there and it tends to create a little bit more flare on the bow. Um, the camera's distorting it a little bit here. It's even more pronounced in the flesh. 
But what's happening is by taking that frame out, it becomes a lot easier to build, but they end up a little bit fine in the bow, a little bit narrow gutted, and to me, it's not a good look. We've all seen that sort of turned down thing here, and, um, and it's a pretty ugly kind of a look. So, um, whilst I've compromised the thickness of the shear strake, or the width of the shear strake, by climbing a bit early up the stem, it still ended up a, a pretty good outcome. And uh, I'm very happy with it. But some people, you know, have a rubbing stroke down here. Could clean that line up a little bit, I guess. So the materials that I've used and the manner in which I've used them have determined the shape. And, uh, and it's what we've come to enjoy in traditional boats. The backbone of Moonlight is hue and pine. Underneath that, there's a couple of inches of dead wood, which is Tasmanian blue gum. Getting those first couple of strokes on is a real doozy, and it sorts you out right at the beginning of the project. If you can manage that, then you're good for the rest of the project. Once you've set up that centre line, putting the, uh, the rest of the strokes on is relatively simple. Scribe the bottom line and then let the top flow to where it wants to go. I think I said elsewhere here that there were five frames. In actual fact, there were three main frames and then the fourth one right up near the bow. The shape of the, uh, of the boat means that the top three strokes need to be scarfed and that means uh, glued to accommodate the curvature. Once the hull's formed, the ribs can go in. Again, um, that timber needs to be very straight grain and not seasoned at all so that uh, it can go in green in order to be able to heat them up and have them bend very easily. In my case, uh, I had seasoned the timber too much and we broke a few. Wasted a bit of hill and pine, unfortunately, and then we resorted to using celery top pine, which is another beautiful Tasmanian timber, for the remainder of the ribs. Here she is looking all snotty and dirty, sitting in the paddock, ready to launch in the lake, which was next to the little cottage that we lived in when we first got married. Launching day was pretty exciting. Um, as with many things that I've done in life, I can't wait till things are finished. Delayed gratification is not one of my strengths. And uh, so she was launched just with a primer coat um, so that we have proof of concept before put all the finishing touches in. We had a little uh, wing motor, which I installed originally. It used to leak a lot of oil, so I replaced it with the Honda. Here she is on a family outing, once again on the lake beside the cottage that we lived in. I've never been overly fussy about maintenance, but um, I think I've restored her twice over a 40 year period. She's not perfect, in fact she's got many flaws, but she's been well used and enjoyed over the decades. I'd like to think that she'll become an intergenerational family legacy. I hope you've been enjoying this series of videos on uh, the story of Moonlight and Cruising Dinghy Basics. Um, something that would be really helpful to keep the videos coming would be if you could interact with them in some way. Um, subscribe, click on the bell so that you get a notification and uh, even put a comment down. I do reply to all the comments that I get on the channel. Tasmania is really Moonlight's home and eventually I'm planning to take her back there. This is uh, Frasenay Peninsula. You can see, still see a few scars underneath where I scraped the coral up at Harvey Bay and haven't got around to turning her upside down. But uh, she, the paintwork's still in pretty good nick underneath and she doesn't leak at all. And uh, I am planning to take her off the trailer and empty her out, turn her upside down and do a bit of work on it in the next hmm, five to ten years.